This is a really um, exciting panel from my perspective. Um, many of us in this room have worked very hard on teacher effectiveness policy, um, but mostly focused on uh, evaluation uh, and staffing decisions. And it seems like scant attention has been paid in our country to uh, preparation, uh, and that that's a huge glaring omission. When you look at the best uh, performing education systems in the world, they are very selective uh, in who can be a teacher, and the preparation is very strong. So I'm really glad we're focused on it. It's a credit to FEE, uh, and we are um, blessed to have uh, three terrific panelists. Uh, first, we have Kate Walsh uh, from the National Council for Teaching Quality, whose recent report um, made significant waves, and rightly so, in assessing uh, the quality of teacher prep programs. She's going to walk us through a PowerPoint on that. Uh, John Legg, who is a state senator in Florida uh, that uh, championed legislation to tie teacher data back to teacher preparation programs, a step that um, several states um, have either taken or are looking at. Really um, wonderful to have him. And we had uh, Secretary Hannah Scandera from uh, New Mexico. Now, that is not Secretary Hannah Scandera for those of you who know. She had to go back to New Mexico, so um, it's wonderful that Rain Martin, uh, who is the executive director of Stanford Children in Louisiana, uh, is joining us. They are pursuing um, very thoughtful, uh, bold uh, set of proposals in Louisiana that she will share uh, with the audience. So let's start with Kate. Good afternoon. Is this working? Yeah, there we go. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. I take it as a very good sign that so many people in the room, and hopefully you're not going to be here to throw tomatoes. If, the, if this were a higher ed audience, I might have my doubts. So <laughs> I'm going to assume this is a friendly bunch and um, talk to you a little bit about why I think this, this topic is probably the single most important topic that's really not been sufficiently on the radar, as Jonas said. Um, in state legislatures, in school boards, in districts. Um, this is an issue that um, has been deeply, um, uh, has been frustrating for a lot of people for a long time. And I think we've all sort of walked away and said, I, we give up. Um, and I'm hoping that we can leave you with a little bit of inspiration today about the things that you can do to address teacher preparation. I, I, I think Amanda Ripley is on the agenda for the conference, is she not? Well, if you get a chance, do go see her because um, she just wrote a book where she walks through um, several countries and what they did to turn, turn their education systems around. And they did the opposite of what we've done, which is to start at the back end. We're starting, uh, they started at the beginning. They started with teacher preparation about who goes into the profession. So that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. So. Okay, so um, here very quickly is why te teacher preparation matters. And it matters now more than it's ever mattered because there are so many first-year teachers in the classroom right now. There's never been, this is the largest group of teachers there is, are first-year teachers. And just 10 years ago, it was 15 teachers with 15 years of experience. And so this is a, there are a million and a half kids being taught by first year teachers. It's extremely frustrating to school districts that are working very hard to turn their districts around. And they are faced with so much raw new uh, blood that really doesn't know what it's doing. All right, so, um, and we know from a lot of research that First year teachers don't teach as well as other teachers. Now, lest you, be, lest you believe that that's just something we have to accept, it is not. Um, if you look, there are quite a few teachers who can teach as well as um, a fifth year, not a fifth year experienced teacher. This is not something that, is, that we just have to accept. Of course, we all get better um, over time. This is what I think is the most shocking bit of data I'm going to show you. And this shows teachers who have spent a couple of years of training, two or three years of training, and compares them to teachers who have had six weeks or maybe less of training. I think this is absolutely shocking in its truth because what we're saying is people who are going through training programs are not coming out and knocking the socks off of teachers who have had little to no training. 
Now, you can um, take what, you can have two reactions to this. Your first reaction might be that uh, training doesn't matter and that we just need a lot of smart Teach for America graduates to go in the classroom and they'll learn over time. That's one point of view. That is the point of view I had 10 years ago. Um, then I started learning a lot about what teachers need to know about teaching reading, what they need to know, the specialized knowledge in elementary mathematics, the very deep body knowledge of, uh, in classroom management that all teachers would benefit from if they were exposed to it in the course of their training. I could go on and on. There is so much knowledge and there's so much practice that teachers need to have before they go in the classroom that we, would, we look to a future where a superintendent would never want to hire a Teach for America graduate. Now that isn't, you know, I'm a big Teach for America fan. I brought him to Baltimore when I was a program officer in a foundation uh, 20 years ago. But um, really, are they the best we can do? We can do better. Okay, so what's going on here? Why aren't people coming out of teacher preparation and doing a better job? I'm going to give you a little insight. Um, it took me, you can be the benefit of my own slow learning. Um, and what I learned uh, after studying this for about 15 years, um, and that is that um, training teachers is not the responsibility of ed schools. Did anyone in this room know that? <laughs> but uh, the field absolutely in the 1970s rejected the notion that it was their job to train teachers. I, pulled up a, I put up a couple of quotes here from um, a volume written by the leading teacher educators in the field in a few years ago in this volume put up by AERA that speaks to how much they disdain training. They see training as a technical transmission activity. I don't know what that means, but I know it's not a good thing. <laughs> um, and um, I, I would dismiss this as a lot of scholarly back and forth that didn't mean much if we hadn't spent the last 10 years looking at course syllabi and textbooks in the nation's 1,400 programs, and I can tell you this is absolutely pervasive. They do not believe that training is what they should be doing. So what should they be doing? Now, you have to bear with me again because I'm not sure that I can explain this adequately, um, but they believe to, I think in the language that's probably most understandable to you, they believe in creating a lifelong learner. They believe that you need to create a professional identity, somebody who can walk in the classroom and never prejudge the students before the teacher. So every class is unique, every child is unique, and if I give you a lot of strategies for how you might discipline or might establish discipline in your class, how you might establish important classroom routines that have been supported by research for the past 50 years, if I gave you the benefit of that knowledge, you might run the risk of doing something that um, prejudges your students' abilities or who they are. So there's a heavy emphasis on giving you professional judgment allowing you to go into the classroom and suddenly be inspired by the students before you and without the benefit of any research or practice or anything else, you're going to suddenly figure it out. Okay. So this is, the, um, this is our take. We believe that um, their teacher training ought to matter. Um, that K-12 education does get to call the shots about what training ought to consist of. And that's why when we decided to rate all of the nation's schools of education, we did something that was wildly unpopular. We developed a set of standards that reflect what public schools say they want and need in new teachers. Like, do they know how to teach kids how to read? The second, uh, this, the other things that we want to do is make sure that every program gets rated. The consumers have never had any information about which programs are doing a good job and which ones are not. And we want to do this every year because we know these ratings tend to be extremely motivating to institutions to want to get better. That's why we went to U.S. News and World Report. They, pu they published our ratings. They're going to be publishing them every year. It's why we cut a deal with a company called SearchSoft 
so that school districts in their HR offices will be able to pull up the quality of a teacher's training when they're considering which applicants to interview. Um, it's very important that we penetrate the marketplace and make sure that these ratings matter. I also want to make sure that you know that we have a whole set of policy tools that accompany this. This is not something we're looking only to the marketplace, but there are a lot of policy solutions, and I believe you have a handout that goes through a number of what those solutions might be. Okay, so the base, this is basically the idea. Give people the ability to pick a secondary program, the best rate of one within X miles of their home. Okay, so there's four areas that we select. The first one is probably the most important um, for this nation because at the moment we have made it so easy to get into a school of education that it is often the least selective program on a campus. In fact, I can promise you that there are programs in every state in this country which make it easier to get into the ed school than they do to qualify academically to play college football. And that's, and that's not hyperbole, that is a fact. We also looked at subject area preparation, which is becoming increasingly important for uh, the Common Core. We look at a lot of, we want to see a lot of evidence of practice. Those of you who are familiar with the Relay Graduate School of Education that's been started by that renegade Norm Atkins, he, it's the same idea, practice, 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 until you become really good. Um, and then outcomes. As states begin to get value-added data before them, we want to make sure that that is included. Uh, we want to make sure that we look and see whether um, graduates of programs produce higher student achieving, achievement gains than um, other programs, and so you can compare that. I will tell you it is a lot more difficult than we all think that is, so that is probably a solution that is going to be part of many measures that are needed to look at teacher prep. Okay, this is what we found. This is a very um, discouraging news. Believe me, uh, uh, the higher ed believes that uh, NCTQ is out to destroy teacher preparation in the United States. It was very important to us to have a lot of models out there of high performers. Um, so this was not a happy, happy news for us when, when so few programs did so well. So you can see we have a zero to four scale. And then we have something um, uh, at the end, uh, well, not relevant for this, but these are how programs did against some key standards. They're not all of our standards. We had to um, only select a subset of really important standards because so many institutions refused to cooperate with us. We could not get institutions across the United States to turn over basic course material, not a state secret, not an institutional secret, but basic course materials. We had to hire lawyers in nine states and we had to go to court in three. There were four, state, four programs in the country that were four stars in secondary. And I think you can read that, but if not, Furman, Lipscomb, Ohio State, and Vanderbilt. Ohio State, those of you, I know my, um, uh, uh, I have some, my sister here is from Ohio legislature. Ohio State was the best in the country on two fronts. They did well also in elementary. We did not have a single four-star program um, uh, in the country at the elementary level, but Ohio State came the closest at three and a half stars. There were 108 programs on our honor roll out of the entire uh, nation, um, and that is not, a, that's again, not very good news for us. We're trying to create a consumer tool, so it's very, it's, it's not good to be able to say there is not a three or four star program within 100, 200 miles of your home. Um, but we hope, we're trying to work, look to other um, other strategies to try to create momentum behind that. I'm just going to show you very quickly how we did on a few of our standards. Again, I told you this is one of the biggest problems in the United States is how easy we make it to get into a school of education. Um, Finland takes the top 10 percent. Um, people have studied nations around the world that do really well on international tests, have learned that we need to take from the top third. Our criteria is will you just take from the top half? That's all we want to see. Will you take from the top half? You don't get more points for being Harvard. Uh, you get points just for being adequately selective. Um, those programs at the end with this trophy, there are 125 programs that are both selective 
Um, but many of those are get a trophy because they're not just selective, they're also uh, create a di they also are very careful about recruiting a diverse teaching pool. So there are 85 programs in this country that speak to the ability, the possibility that you can be selective and gosh, you can recruit talented minorities as well. Isn't that great news? A lot of school boards refuse to budge on this issue because they say we're going to lose popular, uh, lose minorities in the profession. But the truth of the matter is, talented minorities are turning away from teaching just the same way as talented white kids are. Okay, so if I don't skip through, uh, this is extremely important to Common Core. Um, is our teachers getting basic uh, knowledge of nonfiction subject areas uh, that they'll be needing in the literacy block, science and social studies. And you can see only seven programs in the United States got um, uh, four stars and a trophy, and another 34 got four stars. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, I just want to bring drive this home, what this means. Sort of, uh, you know, I think that uh, it's very easy for me to stand up here and sort of give you one star, two star, three star. Um, if you were to in our, be in our offices and see what we read in terms of what um, colleges are asking of um, new teachers and how they treat them like the children themselves that are one day going to teach, it's very, um, there, there's, um, it's remarkable uh, the, how they're talked down to in a way. I mean, they really are treated like they are the elementary children they may one day teach. But just to give you an example, if we wonder why this country has a problem in the STEM areas, our elementary teachers never even have to take a basic science course. And that's fine, you could say you could get this in high school, you come in, you know all this chemistry, physics, and biology, whatever you need to know, it's easy to teach elementary grades, but no one's testing to make sure they have that knowledge. So we look for two things, are they testing for this, or are they requiring this coursework? And they can pass either way, and unfortunately most do not pass. Okay, early reading preparation. Every time I deliver this slide, I get myself in trouble because it's the one time I use the word malpractice. And every time a reporter leaves the room and says, Kate Walsh has said that um, ed schools in the United States are guilty of malpractice. I'm only referring to reading preparation. This is where we have the most solid knowledge about what teachers need. And this is what they're not getting. This is, this is indisputable and yet we are depriving teachers of this very essential knowledge of what they need to teach reading well. So what it is that they get instead? It's, it's very easy for us all to think that they're just getting whole language. Everybody's heard of the reading wars, whole language versus phonics, but they're not getting that. They're instead, they're taught to develop their own philosophy of teaching and reading. Going back to what I said at the beginning of my introduction, remember? I said it's not about giving you the benefit of anyone else's experience or knowledge. I can tell you, after looking at thousands of reading courses in this country, it's all about you will decide yourself how you will want to teach reading. You, Miss 21-year-old, who's never done anything before in terms of teaching reading, you're going to decide, you're going to go in a classroom, and you're going to be magically inspired to figure out how to teach reading. Okay, so just very quickly, I really hogged the mic, and I apologize for that. just had a lot to get through. Um, we're going to be doing this again next June. We're going to have more institutions. We had 600 institutions this time, 608. This time we're going to have at least 800. We hope to get to all 1,100 in our sample um, within three years. It's really essential that we do that. Um, we are also out talking with states. We're happy to come to your state. If you want us to raise this as an issue in your state, we're more than happy to come out and talk about it. There's a long list of things that you can do. Uh, I don't even think legislators are quite aware of how much authority they have over teacher preparation. It's remarkable. I know that the higher ed grumbles about it all the time, but we can use this to our uh, favor at this point and really move on such things as licensing tests, admissions requirements, and all sorts of other things. And there are a lot of really creative ideas as well. Okay, so I've um, put this up here, but that is something you all can read in your handout, and we can move on. I, I apologize for taking so long. It's fine. Actually, if you leave that up, that's great. Sure. So I it's a couple of pages, but. Okay. Um, yeah. So we're going to actually transition to uh, Senator Legg now to talk about one 
um, piece of legislation that um, he's championed. Sure. Well, well, thank you very much, and thanks, Kate, for that research, because Florida kind of moved on that. And for, for the legislators in that room, I'll kind of simplify it for us, because I'll speak legislator language, which is very simple language, is, uh, is um, in Florida. In Florida, every year we have a very important uh, matrix that comes out for our colleges and universities, and it really drives policy in the state of Florida. And actually, this, this, the, 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 the uh, formula and the, the data is actually nationwide. And it, it drives not only our colleges and universities, it also drives our K-12 system. And that, that data that's released every 1st of August, as many of you probably heard it, is called the AP, top, uh, AP poll, the top coaches poll of football every year. What are the top football standings of, of all our colleges? And it gets a lot of press, and it, it, it affects a lot of things in the state of Florida. And the reason why I say that is a little bit tongue in cheek is we rank our college football, our programs in our state of Florida and throughout our nation. It gets a lot of press and it drives everything down the chain. The high school football, high schools where our kids prepare, it changes behavior. That ranking changes the behavior of our college programs. It changes the behavior of our K-12 programs. If you look at law schools, what do law schools do every year? What does the U.S. News report? They rank what are the top law schools. You know, as of, as of right now, uh, Yale is the top in law schools. What do our medical schools do? They rank what are the top medical school programs. And it has that trickle-down effect going all the way down is how do we get into that top program? What are they doing to make that program number one? But what yet when we get into arguably the most important aspects of our national economy, in my view, which is our educational system, what are our top educational preparation programs? You get this timey-wimey, wiggly-wobbly, well, we really don't know. We really don't know. And then you begin to get in this argument that we had in Florida, or, or actually nationwide, is, well, are, are all uh, college preparation programs, teacher preparation program, equal? And most people would say, no, they're not. But then what, 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 what makes them different? What makes one better than the other? And, you don't, you, and without Kate's research here, up until her research, you didn't, you didn't have a clear answer. You just, well, the school that I went to was the best program. That is kind of the, the anecdotal pro program. I went to the University of South Florida, and so when I went, someone told me what teacher program is best for you, I, I would say USF. Why? Well, I don't know. It's just that's one I went to, so it's got to be the best. And we had no data that went to it. So what Florida did, Florida went through and we, we created some matrices, and I'm not going to say these are the perfect matrices, but they were matrices that we thought were a good starting part this year in order to kind of evaluate the teacher prep program. And it was all initiated from the race to the top application and it began to drive behavior. And it began to drive, and we think it will change the way colleges of eds work in Florida. We used the lever of the reauthorization of the education preparation program as the lever to reauthorize that program in order to be eligible. And what, is it, what does it look like? I'll give you just kind of a high level over what it looks like. 50% of it is based on outcomes. 50% of the grade is based on outcomes, teacher and student outcomes. One is the placement rate of teachers. Are, are the teachers actually going into the field of education when they leave, when they leave the colleges of education? And one of the other matrices is the retention data for the teacher. Are the, is the teacher still working in education one year, three years, five years after they graduated the program? What is the data of the students? What is the data of the students? And translate that back to the College of Education where they came from. So make those College of Education responsible for the student data that is in the course, the classes that the teachers are preparing from, from their organization. We also had other components which are probably less controversial, but nevertheless, you are linking it back to the colleges of education, professional responsibility, instructional practices or others. We also looked at what are the critical shortage areas that the teacher preparation programs are, are producing in those areas. The, the one bit of caution that I, would, that I would send out there for those legislators that are looking at this is that don't do the mistake that Florida made, is, is we allowed flexibility you, you hear the buzzword from all the school districts all the time, give us flexibility, flexibility, we need flexibility. Well, the moment you give a certain amount of flexibility, they will be there next year saying, well, it's the legislature's fault because they didn't dictate to us how to implement this. 
And one of the issues is we gave flexibility in student data. And so what, what many school districts, not all, but what many school districts did is they allowed the teacher evaluation to reflect as if they didn't have an assessment for the teacher, they allowed the school-wide grade to reflect in the evaluation. So we had to come back and put into this bill that the teacher, only those, only the, the student and the teacher have to be linked. You cannot give a teacher the grade for a student that they never taught. So that was a very important, critical, and controversial piece that we made a mistake two years ago in doing that we fixed with this piece of, piece of legislation. Uh, another important component that uh, we felt in Florida that was, was important, and I will say I just felt like important as a, as a classroom teacher, is nothing substitute, absolutely no amount of training substitutes for getting your hands dirty and getting into the field and getting some real class work done. And, and field work, actual clinical experience from all the data that we've seen is a huge component. We integrated that into this, this piece of legislation, that that is a critical component. We can talk about theory all we want, but when you get into the classroom, and my daughter's a, uh, now a second year teacher, and one of the first things she said is, Dad, it's nothing like they said in school. It's, it's, and any first year teacher can say that. You, know, you, don't, you just can't adequately prepare and adequately train unless you get, get those uh, teachers into the, the field. We developed a feedback loop of, develop, of developing an unsatisfactory teacher rating. And then anyone that gets that label, the school, the College of Ed that produced them, have to, has to provide more training for them free of charge. They, 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 ha they get a free of charge do-over back to that college where they, because they got that rating. Some political aspects. I was asked to talk a little bit about a political aspect. Well, how did you, how do we in Florida uh, managed to get some sort of such a controversial piece of legislation through. Uh, and let me give you the vote count because I think that's indicative of, 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 of maybe some of the battles and how Florida went about doing it. In the Florida House, it passed by a vote of 110 to 7. And in the State Senate, six, or 29 to 6. The point that I'm saying about this, it wasn't as controversial as many would think. Now, I think Florida may be a little different. And the reason why I say that is, is we had a different approach. This is part of an ongoing reform that we're doing in Florida. If I was to give advice to any legislators of, as they are doing this, is you have to win some battles first. And what are those battles? And it, you would think in this room that this is a real battle, but it absolutely is a real battle. The very first battle that you have to win is that teachers matter. That teachers in the classroom, they matter. That, qual that quality teacher matters in the classroom. Because you will hear every excuse known to man that maybe it is not such a leading indicator of success, that maybe the teachers themselves don't matter as much. So you have to win that battle first. The second battle that you have to win is that student data matters, is that the data of that student actually matters, that you can measure students and that that data actually matters. If you win those two battles, you're, you're, you're starting to get some steam. And the third one that you have to win is that not all teacher programs are equal. If you can win those three battles prior to a bill being introduced, you will get the same results. I will tell you on the Senate floor, there was, there was narrowly a question on the bill. And in the, in the Florida House, it passed fairly easily without much, much opposition. Matter of fact, in our state committees going through the educational process, we didn't even have a single no vote going through our education committees. The education committees got it. They got that teachers matter. They got that students matter. And they got that all programs weren't, weren't, were not necessarily equal. And it made it a logical step of, well, then we need to go back and we need to look at what we're doing with teachers. You know, I, I was told this great analogy, and, and going back to the, the football reference, is, you know, we look at what we do with teachers all the time. And you look at these athletes. We, give, we train them, and we train them in high school. We train them in college. We put them out on the, in the pros, and we give them coaches, and we train them, and we train them, and we train them. What do we do with our teachers? We put them in a theoretical video game in a classroom, and they, we put them out into the playing field without any coaches, without any real-life experience, and then we expect them to succeed. And as you know, the, the results aren't all, unless they're just naturally gifted and naturally talented, so the results don't always reflect that. So this bill, what we did is, it's a first step, and like always with most pieces of legislation, I'm sure we'll be back next year tweaking some of the implementation problems, which we always do. But I believe it was a good first step in reforming and doing that feedback, that loop that we needed with teacher preparation.
Thank you, Senator Leg. Um, so, Rain, you're about to embark on this in Louisiana. I think um, everyone's going to be really interested in the, the thoughtful approach that I know you've worked closely with Kate Walsh on and people at NCTQ. Sure. So, if anyone doesn't know, yesterday was Boss's Day, and I would like to thank my boss, Mr. Jonah Edelman, <laughs> for putting me on the panel 30 seconds before it started um, <laughs> today. So, thank you for that. I'd also like to apologize to our Government Affairs Director, Jason Hughes, wave your hand, because I'm gonna be discussing things that we really haven't discussed writ large in Louisiana yet <laughs> um, as well. So, and I'll just take a few minutes to tell you what Louisiana already has done on this issue because there are some interesting things that we've done a ways ago that we actually think lead to a pathway of doing some new things now. Um, why we think it's time to take action now on this and what some of the things are that we're actually considering. So Louisiana was the first state to have a value-added study for their teacher preparation programs. Has anybody in the audience heard of this before? A few have. So this has actually been in place for six years, and it's done by one of the uh, universities, Louisiana State University. And what they do is every year they actually analyze all first-year teachers, and they actually tell you, based on value-added data, where first-year teacher, teachers are averaging against your average tenured teacher in Louisiana. So you can actually see which prep programs are producing teachers that are doing better than your average experienced teacher or worse than your average experienced teacher. Um, it's actually been pretty noteworthy. A lot of people have looked at the study and I know now there are a lot of states who are considering um, that particular a study as part of their next path. We've also done a lot around teacher evaluation work, teacher compensation. So Louisiana has a law right now that requires 50% of all teachers' evaluation be based on student data. Uh, we have a law that requires a reduction in force, requires compensation decisions to all be used based on that evaluation. So we have quite a few things on the back end to deal with the fact that we need to support teachers better and ultimately release teachers from the classroom who may not be making it. Um, why we think we need to approach this particular issue right now is a couple of things. Um, I actually used to work at the State Department of Education and created a program called the Trailblazers, and it was a number of superintendents who were really more progressive around the state and who we were cultivating as being change agents at the local level with some of the education reform. And one of the first things I would ask them when we sat down to talk is, how do you recruit your teachers? And do you know about the value-added teacher preparation study? And none of them knew about it. None of them actually used the study to do any of their recruiting. So that was sort of remarkable that that existed. Also, as Kate mentioned, Common Core is coming up. And it's incredibly key that teachers that are in, the profession, in their preparation now be prepared in a much different way than they are now coming into the profession. We also in Louisiana have double the number, we produce double the number of elementary teachers needed per year. So Louisiana produces about 1,300 elementary school teachers, but we only need about 600 actually per year. Another interesting data fact. And we just feel that this is actually really the right direction to go. It's, it's hard to be able to work with teachers, work with educators and say, you know, you, when you get in the classroom, you have got to get your job done or we're gonna be on you, essentially, right? We're gonna support you, but if you don't get better, you're gonna have to exit the profession without also realizing that there also is a moral obligation to say, what are we doing to make sure the teachers coming in are actually better prepared? So it's just really the right time to be addressing that issue as well. So here are some of the things that we're considering. And you know, I, I like to really be on the very front end of any particular sort of policies coming on. And that makes it really challenging because really there aren't a lot of models out there on this, quite frankly. And we'll see from Kate's list and in Kate's study, there's a lot of things one could do on this. And so it's exciting to me, probably not for our staff most of the time and other people that we work with that there aren't a lot of models out there and you kind of need to be creative on what you want to do. And we've talked about this issue even in our own staff probably the last four to six months saying what is the right thing. And where we're landing right now is actually that we would look at inc increasing the bar to entry for students coming into teacher preparation programs. So one of the things right now, that Louisiana, people that wanna go into a teacher preparation program either need to pass a basic skills exam, which is called the Praxis, or get a 22 on the ACT. 
we're actually looking at, and again, this is all under consideration, not fully vetted yet, but right, saying that the ACT is required and that the cut score would be around 22. And we're looking at that number. We're not solid on it, and we're, we're actually basing it on what we're looking at in terms of the analysis of the ACT scores per average across our Louisiana universities and specifically for our teacher preparation programs. Because it is important that we also make sure we take the diversity question into consideration. So we're looking at which colleges might be impacted, what teacher preparation programs, and what communities would be impacted. We're also thinking we probably need to have some sort of percentage of students that could get into programs that may not meet that bar, but that you have a percentage where universities could have some flexibility on, on letting folks in who may not reach that exact bar. Uh, we're also talking about how do you make the time in, in the uh, clinical process more effective to, to the senator's point over here. And we're thinking of expanding that time and also ensuring that the teachers who are exposed to that time are mentored by teachers who are considered highly effective under the teacher evaluation system that we currently have. Now there's some complications with that administratively. I'm sure any of you who are educators know, you know you're gonna have short numbers of those folks to start with. How do you make sure you really operationalize that? But we do think it's important that new folks have access to people who are doing really well. We also, and this is actually a recommendation that um, Kate has made to us for some time now, we want to actually make sure that our value-added teacher preparation study itself is tied to our accountability system. Right now, it's just a study that exists. We actually have seen universe, at one university program who shut itself down because publicly they kept getting bad scores and they were getting a lot of public heat for it, but we still haven't actually made a formalized process where that study becomes part of the review of your continued existence in Louisiana. So those are some of the things that we're considering now around this. Now with Louisiana, we've also looked at where does one make these changes from a policy standpoint, and you'll be happy to hear Representative Landry, who's in the back, that these are not legislatively required. <laughs> these are things that actually would go through our state board. Um, and so we're working now to think about how do we get the universities on board with some of these notions first, actually do some work with them, and then these would be things that we would work through our state board of education. Thank you. Okay, now we'd like to, thank you. <laughs> you see why I wanted her to participate 30 seconds before. Um, so we'd like to open it up to your questions. We have uh, mics here and look forward to hearing from you. And if you're also doing something uh, in your state, we'd love to hear about that as well. Hi. Um, I don't know if this is on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I have a, this question is probably more for Kate than it is for everybody else, but please chime in if, if it applies. Based on what we just heard, there's a lot of red meat there that just is like, oh my God. But are you suggesting that from your research that the teachers of ed schools have been are getting taught differently than the t they used to teach their kids, their, their students. Basically, I mean, if California used to be number one, like we heard at lunch just a minute ago, they used to be number one, now they're, 40, they're 46th and 47th uh, in reading and math. Are California schools of ed no longer making their grads, their students of gra graduating, requiring with the same requirements they used to graduate with? So when they're going into the public school system, they're coming away with a different set of skills. If California's teachers used to be able to teach kids and have them at the level, you know, number one, is um, are you saying that schools have either dumbed down their ed programs and their ed syllabuses? And if you are saying that, uh, why would an ed program do that? <laughs> um, well, th that's a great and extremely complicated question. I think uh, you might have been referring to my remark that in the 1970s, ed schools decided that it was no longer their job to train teachers, and they made a very um, conscious an articulated decision to do that. Um, I would suggest, though, that at the time it wasn't that meaningful a decision because there was very little knowledge about what it meant to train a teacher anyway. Um, we, had, uh, we had some knowledge of how to teach reading, but very little knowledge on, on many other fronts. Um, so the decision didn't have as much consequence um, then as it ended up having many decades later when we do have so many different things. Uh, in the field of cognitive um, psychology, for example, didn't exist in 1970 by, for all intents and purposes. So that has informed, you know, really what, um, how to manage classrooms and, 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 and special ed implications. So, um, and so to get to the second part of your question, uh, why would uh, programs dumb down? 
They were dumbed down to, um, because the profession was no longer attracting um, the, the student, ca the caliber of student it, it attracted in the 1950s and 60s, when women and minorities had no other choice but to go into teaching or nursing. Um, so to uh, meet uh, the, the declining um, uh, power, uh, brain power is coming in, programs got uh, less and less, um, you know, they, they, they aimed less high. Let's put it that way. Yes. Uh, uh, I'm Giselle Huff with the Jacqueline Newman Foundation. Um, so my question is three parts. Um, in the course of this presentation, I heard nary a word about technology or the power of what's happening in, in the world of technology. Um, so if you talk about the, the schools of ed per se, you have Western Governors uh, University, which is producing teachers uh, entirely online with some clinical work in their local uh, you know, schools. Uh, you've got MOOCs coming out of our ears, uh, and we all have the blended learning movement in the K-12 space, which requires a completely different kind of training from the teachers. Uh, are you taking that into account? Well. Um, it's, you're, you're asked a really interesting question about technology and something that we looked very carefully at developing a standard on when we developed our standards. And um, what we wanted to see was were teachers um, taught to use technology that uh, pertain to their subject area rather than uh, a lot of state legislatures have passed course requirements that schools must teach a, cor a course in technology. And, what they end up do is teaching 18 or 19 year olds what they already know how to do themselves and could teach themselves. They, um, so we wanted to make sure it's subject specific. Um, and we've done some work on that, but it's just very much along the edges. So I won't, I won't pretend to say that it that meets your needs. Um, we looked at blended learning and we went out and talked to folks at Rocketship and other, um, other big um, blended learning schools and we said, you know, what, what is it that your teachers need to know to do well to come in? And they said absolutely nothing. Just, just give us a well-educated teacher. Um, th th what we're doing is not rocket science. Um, it, it requires some professional development on the job, but there's nothing magic about what we're doing or it requires some specialized knowledge about how to run a blended learning classroom that we feel would require a lot of pre-service education. So that's, I would say at this point the door is not shut on that, but uh, we're in a learning mode. And, and if I could do dovetail into that a little sure. bit and, and answer more, more not in the side of, of uh, acquiring knowledge through technology, but ensuring that our teachers know how to implement technology is, is, is I think we're at a huge deficit right now in our colleges of ed. Um, and several schools in Florida have went to one-to-one -one devices. And one of the things that we've seen talking to the teachers and the principals that those schools have gone one-to-one -one is in talking to them one-to-one, -one, I remember talking to, directly to one of the principals and asking, well, how are the students accepting this? How is it going and implement? She looked at me, she goes, no, that's the wrong question. The question is, is how are the teachers able to accept it and implement it? Because in the colleges of education, and as Kate said earlier, they're teaching them items that they already know, but they're not teaching them how to implement the content into the classroom. Right. And you know, who would have thought three years ago of the iPad revolutionize or, or whatever the tablet device is, education and what we see in those schools that are going one-to-one, -one, that they are using this technology, that our teachers are, are ill-prepared to teach the, the content and the delivery mechanism and in the styles that, that our students now are learning. And they are, they are way ahead of the teachers. Um, and I don't want to put the uh, colleges of ed too much under the bus because that technology is, is changing and evolving rapidly and our colleges of eds are a dinosaur in how they adapt to that new, new type of delivery mechanism. So I, I, we, have to, we have to change that mechanism because the market forces will change it. Our students, our students are demanding it. Our students are, demand, are demanding it today. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Cookson, and I'm the uh, chairman of the Education Committee in Missouri and the former teacher, principal, and superintendent. So I've had a little background in all those areas. And one of the things we're starting to see is we've talked a lot about uh, quality education, quality teacher programs, but there's a little disconnect we don't focus very much on 
quality school leaders and quality yep. evaluators. Mm -hmm. And if we don't start talking about that in our colleges of education, we're not going to be able to make that leap to, to get the results that we actually want for our schools. So could you address, are there, are there, uh, is there a movement in the College of Education in these uh, universities and colleges to address that? I know a while ago you talked about 50 superintendents didn't even know what you were talking about. Could you address I mean, I, that? I, I'd just like to say I think that's a wonderful point, and it's something we hear a lot about even on the evaluation side. Mm -hmm. Like, why isn't it that we're doing a lot more on the school leader piece? Uh, my experience has been that there's not nearly enough going on in that space, and that even those of us in this space aren't doing enough to address that particular issue. Um, right now, the most creative things I'm seeing are still on the K-12 side, like what are ways in which we can provide inter-rater reliability training for evaluators. Um, but I still personally haven't seen any of that stuff on the higher ed side, and I appreciate you making that note because it's probably something we need to consider even as we consider our Louisiana stuff. Thank you. And, and just to kind of go on to what we're saying, and one of the pieces, it wasn't the focal point of, of the bill that we passed 1664, but it was an important component. Uh, in Florida, at least, we have temporary teaching certificates to allow our teachers to get into the classroom and start to develop some of the skills they, they need. Uh, but the administration path is a very closed, rigid circuit that is, is almost inbred. This particular bill that we passed provided an avenue for basically mentorship programs and, and a temporary administrator certification to work underneath an existing high-performing administrator to, to recognize that. We need to go further, um, but it was opening the door to say that we have to look at our administrators uh, in, a, in a different way and, and break it out of this kind of closed-loop environment uh, that it exists today. Without discounting your excellent remark, I just will make this point. Uh, if you want great principals, you got to have great teachers first because that's a pipeline for great teachers, great, great principals. Yeah. I'm Captain Ed from the Florida Keys. I've been involved in public education for uh, 37 years and just foolishly got myself elected to the school board. <laughs> um, I suspect it's not just that the, the teacher educational institutions uh, have have uh, diminished their standards. We should stop pretending that the challenges of the profession haven't increased exponentially. Teachers are now surrogate parents. They're honorary aunts and uncles. They're life skills counselors, the middle and high school. They're romantic counselors. They're, the, the challenges are enormous. And, and when we, we talk about fair and valid evaluation systems for teachers, um, we overwhelmingly uh, hope for data that, that measure maybe 15 or 20 percent of, of what dedicated caring teachers do for kids in, in, in our modern world. Uh, and, and we have got to pay some attention to that evaluative uh, uh, instrument. Uh, your, your point about the average uh, uh, years of experience of teachers is, is pretty uh, uh, unsettling. Uh, and I think it's going to get lots worse. I think the days are gone when teachers are going to teach for 30 and 35 mm, years. Absolutely. Um, they now, uh, particularly, uh, particularly among the, the, the majority of, of the teaching uh, clan and, and sisterhood are, are women who now have so many other opportunities. Uh, I've known personally more than a thousand teachers personally, and I, I don't know where all the bad teachers are that I keep hearing about at conferences like this. I, I don't know more than a few bad teachers, but I know a hell of a lot of frustrated, frustrated uh, teachers and overburdened teachers who, who can't do what they know the kids need because of the bureaucratic impositions and, and our penchant for obsessive testing. And, and the fact is we spend a lot of time in our schools teaching a damn test. And uh, that's not all that healthy for kids. Uh, uh, we need, uh, the charter school movement has shown us that you can get some interesting results if you diminish the bureaucratic burden and if you allow innovation and so forth. Uh, I think that's great, but we want to be sure to allow that in our traditional public schools. If competition is good, let's take the handcuffs off the public schools and, and let everybody compete and let teachers innovate. Y you got to love kids and you got to love the profession or, or you're in the wrong profession. 
but, but I don't know a lot of those people. They need more support, uh, and, and, and they need, uh, they could make very valuable use of more flexibility, more ability to innovate, and less burdensome. Uh, and we have to be fair, whatever the measurements are, they're valid and fair across the whole spectrum of what dedicated teachers do. Thank you very much. Appreciate the points. Do you want to, anyone want to respond? Um, I, I would just make the point, it is a terrible mistake to use the word bad teacher. What you're talking about is weak teachers, average teachers, middle of the road, but everybody can get better at their craft. And we're talking about we're doing a huge disservice to the teaching profession when we deny the knowledge and skills and practice that teachers can have that will make them better at their craft. Hey, so the, the foundation I represent in Denver, we, um, we work with a lot of the, or several of the high performing charter schools that are really, I mean, the performance is phenomenal. And one of the things that, as I get to know them, get into the schools and talk with their school leaders, one of the things that's very common across all of them is that a majority of their teachers are coming from alternative uh, residency programs. And it's become more important to me now that I have a son who's a sophomore at Dartmouth and passionate about becoming a teacher. And as he's come to me and said, hey, I think I can, there's, they have this program where you can stay an extra six months, get your education certificate, and then teach. And I've gotten him engaged with these leaders of these great schools in Denver, and they say, and, and what's, what are you better off doing? And pretty much all of them say, get him into you know, a relay GSE, a match, mm -hmm. or one of these where you're in the classroom because, Kate, you touched on it at the beginning, it's practice, 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 and evaluation, evaluation, evaluation to get, become a better teacher in that first year. So I guess, I mean, I know a lot of this is about the state, is about the, the education programs in colleges, but you know, the residencies are such a small part of the overall kind of um, numbers, but it seems like the results are so amazing, so I guess, I just ask you to comment on that, and then what do you do? How do you take those things that are successful out of the out of these successful residency programs and drive that into the into the the, the broader schools that where you really the bigger numbers are? You know, I can speak to that a little bit. There is a growing school of thought that instead of doing anything on the front end around teacher preparation, like the things I mentioned, that it's best to lower the bar to entry actually as much as possible and then have those first one or two years of teaching drive the continued certification of teaching, right? And I think that the practice you're talking about sort of lends itself more to that way of thinking. Let's get a diverse group of people in, let's give them practical experience, give them support, and then see how they do, and based on that, do the certification. So it's an interesting, completely different way to think about it, um, but in particular, I know charters, um, TNTP's talked about this a lot, like sort of flipping the dime and considering it in this reverse The only, the only way. thing I would say about that is I would argue that these are successful because the bar is higher. I mean, right. you have to have great, really smart students that are doing it, and I think if you look at, I mean, TFA is one example, but even these other ones, like Relay or Match or others, I mean, it, it's, they're very competitive to get in, so the bar by, by effect is raised. So I love the, I love the discussion no, relay around and match, raising the bar. Re relay and match, don't anybody be deceived. They work because they're, they're getting great caliber right. candidates. Yeah. Exactly. Um, they're not an undergraduate education. That's why I'm saying, when, when I see raise the bar, I love seeing that because you know, I, I hear the statistics that the bottom 25% of, of students out of colleges are making up our next teacher core, and it's like, if that's really true, it's a big problem. So. I mean, I, I think it's a combination yeah, of both. We're doing um, the, a new thing. We're trying to pilot the British model of inspections. And just the last couple of weeks, we were in Texas. Uh, well, not we, I, I want to be very clear, this is not NCTQ doing it. We've been supportive of this getting off the ground, and we've, and we've worked with a company in the UK to do this. And they were at one of the most selective colleges in Texas. And um, the inspectors, half of whom were British, they came away from that and they talked to the dean after and said, you know, you're just delivering pablum to these really smart kids in your class. You're wasting their intellectual capital. The things that you're having them do are not respectful of the fact that they worked really hard and they're really smart kids who got into one of the best schools in Texas. Why aren't you taking advantage of how smart they are? And you know, so like, th this is a problem. I mean, it, it, Smart kids are not going to gravitate towards programs where they're made to feel unsmart. And, and if, if I could come make a quick comment and, and kind of add a little bit to what you're saying is we also have to look at what is the content area that is starting to be demanded of our schools. And going back to the technology issue is, is 
you look at some of the teachers that, that are going into the field, uh, you know, we want to make sure that they have the skills and that are needed for some of these technology uh, implementations that, that are supposed to be required or that they want to teach in the classroom. Point I'm getting to is some of those skills just are not in the normal uh, colleges of education program at all and may never be there. And we have to look at well, what, what is outside of the normal college of eds and how can we prepare them to become good teachers. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe everyone can be a good teacher uh, who's outside of the teaching profession. I think you know, there are some skills that they have to learn, but we do need some of that content area that perhaps our colleges of education just may never ever be able to actually teach them, such as some of the things that are going into the digital skills now. Thank you. Uh, my name is Elliot Aspen. I'm with the Colorado Department of Education. We're having a broad-based and intense discussion in our state around the nature of licensing and, and um, certification. <laughs> Likely have some legislation on that as, as in other states. So what do you see the role of, um, and you've talked about it a little bit already, alternative certification in dealing with this issue, and also do the same kinds of standards fit for those programs, and are we seeing them evaluated in the same way? Sometimes it feels like we just do something different. It's magic, and um, I'm not sure we want to depend on that. So. That's great. Well, you're asking, um, you're, you're raising, uh, putting the elephant on the table here for us. I mean, we, we get criticized, and very rightly so, by the ed schools that we have not rated alternative certification. Uh, we've tried to figure out how to do it with the same standards. Um, and it, the, the, the problem is that we're beginning with the premise that you need a certain amount of pre-service knowledge and practice before you go into the classroom. All cert is premised on getting that while you're in the classroom. So right then and there, out of the box, they sort of fail. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to do a better job of just being clear who's doing the more responsible part. I mean, we could come out with a study that, that fails all these alt cert programs. I, I, I feel a little guilty doing that because the only reason they exist really is because of frustrations over the quality of students that have come out of traditional preparation. So I, I feel like we're making them the victim, I mean, we're making them you know, the enemy when they're kind of, they were, were responding to a need in the market. But we are going to be doing something on alternative certification on, on some limited number of standards. Rand, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I mean, we've talked about making sure that what we do is applicable across the board. Um, I do think it becomes somewhat of a political issue, too, quite frankly. it's I think you don't want everything to apply across the board all the time because it can limit innovation. But then you get in situations in the political space where it becomes very difficult to defend a certain group of people doing something versus others, um, which can then derail your whole attempt to change it exactly. altogether. Thank you. My name is Hugh Blackwell. I'm with the North Carolina House. Uh, I want to <clears throat> attempt to ask a question to sort of drill down a little bit into what I believe was Kate's first standard, which is the selection criteria. I think uh, one of you, may have been Kate, alluded to what I believe was said was that Finland uh, limits admissions to education uh, to the top 10 percent. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is that in Finland, going into education is the second most popular choice that students make after becoming a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and here's where my question goes. If we're talking about upping the requirements so that we only take the, the creamier of the crop, uh, and if we are also thinking a little bit about our concern for diversity and those types of things, uh, I think you all referred to the need to recruit, to do a better job of recruiting. To what extent, in order to have the numbers we need, is compensation for beginning teachers something that it needs, needs to be discussed or thought of while we are raising standards for our schools of education? Oh, I mean, it's absolutely critical. And, and that's really sort of another hat I wear when we do our state, uh, we're not focusing on teacher prep. But um, um, if you want, uh, but I would argue that it isn't so much beginning teacher salaries that you have to worry about. You have to make it possible for, for really excellent teachers to be able to buy a house on the, fact, on the basis of them being excellent. You know, you gotta be able to do a mortgage. You shouldn't be getting um, a $1,500 bonus for having gotten your test scores up 2% that year. 
Um, so this is all about, if you look at other nations, it isn't that their salaries are wildly um, better than ours. Um, so th I, I don't think that's the cure-all here, but it certainly is part of a, a piece. And I, I would just add to that, it, it's not just the compensation, I think that's part of it, but there is, I mean, part of why we do what we do in the K-12 side around this is to help, and teachers have said this specifically, and edu other educators, we need to make the profession feel like and be a highly respected profession again, which includes compensation, it includes things like not letting folks who aren't doing well but who've been there longer stay there. Um, that's why, and there needs to be better public trust of educators, period. And so that's why you ha really have to think of it holistically and sort of look at the teacher prep in tandem with the other things you're doing exactly. on the K-12 side. I'm sure. Senator Howard Stevenson, Chair of the Education Appropriations Committee in Utah. Uh, Kate, I want to invite you to come out to Utah and, and help us with this because we just heard from our deans of all of our colleges of education and they claimed that their students all have the same GPA as the medical school applicants. So we, we, we're an aberration. We just have, we're just getting the best. And I'm sure, I'm sure we can trust their data. So I, I, we want to get you out to help us get a reality dose and to know how to go forward. And Senator Legg, I, I want to get your teacher prep legislation in Utah. My question is to follow on to Giselle Huff's question because, uh, Kate, you let the colleges off the hook when you said, well, the the schools that are using technology say we well, don't need additional training. M I think the real question is here, what about all of those schools who don't know how to use technology? The, school, the teachers aren't getting that training in school. I visited all of our colleges of education and they're not getting any training in any computer assisted instructional software. We even have a Center for the Advancement of Technology and Education at the University of Utah that issues uh, master's degrees in educational technology. And I asked them, what exposure do you give students in the use of one-to-one -one devices or the application of uh, software that uh, enhances improvement in the core subjects? They say, nothing. It hasn't arrived yet. They're gonna wait for the final iteration. Can you imagine what, if, if we had done that in the business world? So uh, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just thinking that we, we, we've got to do those things to, to get that exposure. I, I interviewed a group of students who just got their master's in educational technology, and I shared with them some of the things that were available to, to give students real jump starts in education, early intervention in reading, and how it's doubling reading scores, uh, math software that that treats each student as an individual and increases their math skills and competency. And two of the teachers were crying as I was speaking because they said, we never learned about any of this stuff in our master's degree. So uh, I think we as legislators can, and that's where your legislation, Senator Legg, hopefully is going to help us to craft legislation that will require and help us as legislators know what our possibilities really are. Because yeah. right now it's a disaster. Yeah, I mean, we, we, the, here's, the, here's our problem. We recognize that there, is wonder, there are wonderful things that programs could be doing, but to put it in a standard, we have to put in something that's research-based, that, you know, that is a body of knowledge that was without question every program in the country ought to be doing. That, prob that body of knowledge probably exists, but we have not yet to uh, identify exactly what it is that teachers ought to be doing. But your two examples are, are right on the money. They get to our point. We want to make sure that technology is used to, to advance the content that the teacher is teaching. Let me just suggest a, a semester-long survey course in the types of technology that is currently available today, the types of software, and which ones have shown the greatest promise. At least a survey so that they're exposed mm -hmm. to it, because right now they're not. We're happy to talk about that, absolutely. We're very open to it. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Curtis Johnson uh, with Education Evolving in Minneapolis-St. Paul. I'd like to go upstream from a couple of comments that you've already made. Uh, one of the pieces of the catechism of chronic problems we haven't talked about today is that nearly half of the teachers leave in the first five years. Why is that? 
And even if it, they're drawn from the lowest 25%, we're probably losing the highest 10% of the 25%. It's because many of them discover it's not a very good job. If they wanted to go into a business where it's all management and labor, they'd go with the military. So one of the reasons why we don't attract a higher pool of people into this profession is because it's not really a profession. It's not like architecture, it's not like medicine, it's not like consulting. You're in a profession when you have authority over your work. And there are some 60 schools around the country now in a movement that's growing slowly like ground cover in which teachers are fully in charge of the learning program. Those are all high performing organizations. So maybe one of the things we have to do is make teaching a better job, a better opportunity, a better career, and that could have a profound impact on whether we get more talent coming into the profession. The, the, the one that wasn't really a question, I apologize. <laughs> the, the, that was a good non-question. Well, I appreciate your comment. The one thing I would say to that is, and I, again, I'll, I'll go back to a very anecdotal, my own family issue with my first year do teacher, my daughter being a first year teacher, walking into the classroom, coming home, I remember the first day is, no one ever told me this. No one ever told me that teaching would be like this. And, and it's this reality check that oftentimes, I'm not saying in every program, but oftentimes, their very first reality check is their first day in their first class. And again, it's that, it's, it's that, it's, it's like trying to be in the state legislature by watching West Wing. It just doesn't work that way. It's, it's, it doesn't work like that. It sounds good, but it's not reality. And, and I think a lot of teachers that I see just get discouraged because it's, they feel as though they're doing something wrong because it's not what they were exposed to in college. So I think your point is well taken, but I also think there's a part of reality that has to be taught in our programs as well. Okay. Thank you all very much. Very, very rich dialogue. Thanks to our panelists.